Part 1. No Place for Hiding, Baby, No Place to Run. Chapter 1. Home is an interesting concept. For most people, it's a place of refuge. My first home was anything but. I was born Stanley Burt Eisen on January 20, 1952. The New York apartment my parents took me home to was on West 211th Street and Broadway, at the very northern tip of Manhattan. I was born with an ear deformity called microtia in which the outer ear cartilage fails to form properly and, to varying degrees of severity, leaves you with just a crumpled mass of cartilage. I had nothing more than a stump on the right side of my head, and my ear canal was also closed, so I was deaf. That left me unable to tell the direction of sound and, more importantly, made it incredibly difficult for me to understand people when there was any kind of background noise or conversation. These problems would lead me to instinctively avoid social situations. My earliest memory is being in our darkened living room with the shades drawn, as if to keep the conversation a secret between only my mother, my father, and myself. If anyone ever asks you what happened to your ear, my parents told me, just tell them you were born that way. If we ignore it, my parents seem to intimate, it doesn't exist. That philosophy would rule our house and my life for much of my childhood. I got simple answers for complex situations, and despite the fact that my parents wanted to ignore it, nobody else did. Children seemed to detach the person from the deformity. I became an object instead of a little kid. But children weren't the only ones staring at me. Adults did, too, and that was even worse. One day in a market on 207th Street, just down the road from our place, I realized one of the adults in line was staring at me like I was a thing instead of a person. Oh, God, please stop, I thought. When somebody stares at you, it's not limited to you and that person. Treatment like that draws attention, and becoming the center of attention was horrific. I found the scrutiny and relentless attention even more excruciating than being taunted. Needless to say, I didn't have a lot of friends. On my first day of kindergarten, I wanted my mother to leave as soon as she got me to the door of the class. She was proud, but I didn't want her to leave for the reason she thought. It wasn't because I was independent and sure of myself. I just didn't want her to see me being stared at. I didn't want her to see me treated differently. I was in new surroundings with new kids, and I didn't want to go through that in front of her. The fact that she was proud of me told me that she didn't understand anything about me. My fears went over her head. One day I came home crying. Somebody spat in my face, I wept. I had come home looking for support and protection from my mom. I assumed she would ask who had done it and then go out and find the kids' parents and tell them such behavior was unacceptable. But instead, she said, Don't come crying to me, Stanley. Fight your own battles. Fight my own battles? I'm five. I don't want to hurt anybody. I just want people to leave me alone. But I went back out, and about an hour later, I found the kid who had spit on me. I punched him in the eye, but he barely seemed to remember the incident and couldn't figure out what the big deal was. One thing was clear after that. Home was not a place where I could find help. Whether I was beaten up or taunted or anything else, I had to handle it on my own. We lived practically next door to PS 98, my public elementary school. The school complex had three different yards, each separated from the others by chain-link fences. There was a kid whose name I didn't know, but who knew mine, who shouted at me from behind the fences between the yards. Whenever he spotted me someplace where I couldn't get at him, he'd shout, Stanley the one-eared monster! Stanley the one-eared monster! I had no idea how this kid knew me, and all I could think was, why are you doing this? You're hurting me. You're really hurting me. He was a normal, nondescript kid about my age, with brown hair, small enough that I thought I could beat him up if I ever caught him. But he was always out of reach, always on the other side of a fence or on the other side of a yard, and able to run away into one of the nearby apartment complexes before I could get to him. If only I could catch this kid. And then one day, I finally did. I heard him shout, Stanley the one-eared monster! And as always, the first thing I did was cringe. I heard the voice in my head pleading, Stop doing that! Other people can hear you. Other people are looking at me now. 
and as always there was no place to go to escape the stairs. But this time I managed to run him down and grab him. He was suddenly terrified. Don't hit me, he cried, looking like a frightened rabbit. Stop doing that, I said, grasping him. Stop doing that to me. I didn't hit him. Suddenly facing him like that, I didn't want to. I hoped not hitting him would be enough to put me in his good graces, so I let him go. He couldn't have been thirty yards away before he turned back and yelled, Stanley the one-eared monster! Why? Why are you doing this to me? Why? Although unable to articulate it, I felt incredibly vulnerable and naked, unable to protect myself from the stares, taunts, and scrutiny that seemed everywhere. So I developed an explosive temper as a little boy. Rather than recognize my temper as a sign that I needed help and support and guidance, my parents dealt with it by threatening me. If you don't get that under control, they said in a darkly menacing tone, we're going to take you to a psychiatrist. Now, I had no idea what a psychiatrist was, but it sounded ominous. It sounded like a diabolical form of punishment. I pictured going into a hospital room and having somebody torture me. Not that I felt safe at home anyway. My parents frequently went out at night and left me and my sister Julia, who was only two years older than I was, home alone. Don't open the door for anybody, was all they'd say, leaving a six-year-old and an eight-year-old all on their own. We were so scared we slept with knives and hammers under our pillows. We would wake up early the next day to sneak the weapons back to where they belonged so our parents wouldn't yell at us. I shared the one small bedroom of our apartment with Julia. My parents slept on a pull-out sofa in the living room. Julia started to have mental problems at a very early age. My mother said she'd always been different, even as a baby. She was wild and prone to violence. My sister scared me. And as my own problems intensified, I spent a good deal of time worrying I might end up like her. My parents may not have been very supportive of me, but then again they were not very supportive of each other either. My mom, Eva, was domineering and my dad, William, resented it. My mom portrayed herself as strong and my dad as meek. She considered herself the smart one. In actuality, my dad was very bright and well-read. He had graduated from high school at age 16. Had circumstances been different, he would have gone to college. But his family insisted he start working to help pay the bills, and he did. By the time I came along, my dad worked 9 to 5 as an office furniture salesman. Taken out of necessity, the job was one that, with time, he came to accept, but never to embrace. My mother was a stay-at-home mom when I was little, but she had previously worked as a nurse and as a teacher's aide at a school for children with special needs. Eventually, she started back to work at a redemption center where people went to collect merchandise after filling books of stamps accumulated through various customer loyalty programs offered by supermarkets in the 1950s. My mother's family had fled from Berlin to Amsterdam with the rise of the Nazis. They'd left everything behind, and my mom's mother had divorced, which was rare at the time. After my grandmother had remarried, they'd moved to New York. Members of my mother's family were condescending toward other people, and they weren't beyond ridiculing me about my hair and clothes. I slowly came to realize there was no foundation for the arrogance and sense of self-righteousness shared by my mother's side of the family. They weren't successful, they were just dismissive. If you didn't agree with my mother, you frequently heard a derisive, oh please, delivered with a contempt that made it clear your opinion carried no merit at all. My dad's parents were from Poland, and he was the youngest of four children. My dad told me his oldest brother, Jack, was a bookie and an alcoholic. His other brother, Joe, suffered from uncontrollable manic mood swings that crippled him throughout his life. And my father's sister, Monica, apparently surrendered to pressure from their mother not to leave the nest and never married. Even as a child, I couldn't help but see that expectation as manipulative and selfish on my grandmother's part. My dad spoke of a very difficult and unhappy childhood. He despised his father, who died before I was born. My parents were not happy people. I don't know what the basis for their marriage was beyond what later became known as codependency. They didn't provide anything positive for each other. There was no warmth or affection in the house. Fridays were often the worst day of the week. My dad would be agitated, and the outcome was inevitable. My parents would get into a fight. 
and then my dad wouldn't talk to my mom for the entire weekend. It's childish to act like that for an hour. It's insane to see your own parents acting like that for days on end. In addition to whatever issues they had between themselves, my parents were also consumed with my sister, who got into a lot of trouble and eventually spent many years in and out of mental institutions. Since I was always viewed as the good kid, I got progressively less attention at home. In my case, being the good kid didn't mean I was praised, it meant I was ignored. As a result, I pretty much had free license to do anything. I did not find this a very secure feeling. Security comes from having boundaries and limitations, and without any, I felt lost and unprotected, exposed, and vulnerable. I didn't want or relish the freedom. In fact, it was almost the opposite. I was nearly paralyzed by fear because nobody was there to tell me I was safe. I was alone a lot. I approached every day with a sense of foreboding as I faced the unknown without any safety net. Every new day was uncertain, every new day was unprotected, Every new day meant dealing with a world I wasn't equipped to deal with and trying to decipher the unspoken messages at home. I found refuge in music. Music was one of the few great gifts my parents gave me, and I will be forever grateful to them for it. They may have left me feeling completely adrift, but they unknowingly provided me a lifeline. I'll never forget hearing Beethoven's Piano Concerto No. 5 in E-flat major, the Emperor Concerto, for the first time, I was five, and I was completely blown away. My parents made culture and the art seem a natural part of life. Their appreciation of classical music was palpable. They had a big wooden Harman Kardon radio phonograph console and listened to Sibelius and Schumann and Mozart. But it was Beethoven that left me dumbfounded. On the weekends, I listened to Live from the Met on WQXR with my mom, a tradition I continued even as I got older. Once I started listening to the radio, I also discovered rock and roll. Whether it was Eddie Cochran, Little Richard, or Dion and the Belmonts, it was pure magic. They sang about a glorified life of teenagers that I quickly came to dream of. All that singing about an idyllic concept of youth touched me emotionally. It filled me with the wonder of being a teen and transported me to a wonderful place a place where life's angst concerned relationships and love. Man, what perfect lives these young people lived. One afternoon, I went for a walk with my grandmother. We crossed the 207th Street Bridge into the Bronx, heading toward Fordham Road. On the far side of the bridge was a record shop. We went inside, and my grandmother let me pick out my first ever record, a 78 RPM shellac single of All I Have to Do is Dream by the Everly Brothers. When I want you to hold me tight, if only. While most of the other kids in the neighborhood were out playing cowboys and Indians, I sat indoors and listened obsessively to things like A Teenager in Love and Why Do Fools Fall in Love. For a time, a lot of standards were also turned into doo-wop tunes, and I used to get irritated with my mom when she sang the original versions around the house. That's not how it goes, Mom. It goes like this. Then I would sing the dip-da-dip-dip-dip part of the Marcells version of the 1930s classic Blue Moon. Sometimes she was dismissive about the modern stuff, but for the most part, she just seemed to find it funny. And then I saw some of the singers and the bands I liked. The famous rock and roll DJ, Alan Freed, started appearing on the TV around the same time as the national debut of Dick Clark's American Bandstand. The wildness and danger of somebody like Jerry Lee Lewis wasn't lost on me as he kicked his piano stool away and flung his hair around. What was lost on me was the sexuality of the music, not surprisingly, given what I saw at home. The romantic fantasy I envisioned was clean and sterile, and even as I got older, that's how I continued to view life. It would be many, many years before I realized what a song like the Shirelles, Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow, was really about. Still, there was no argument these people were cool. They were cool because they were singing. They were cool because people were watching them and screaming for them. In that audience, these musicians had everything I craved as a young kid. Adulation. Wow. A few Jewish immigrant families like ours lived in the part of Upper Manhattan where I lived, but it was predominantly Irish. Our next-door neighbors were two lovely old Catholic sisters, Mary and Helen Hunt, who had never married. They became something like aunts or grandmothers to me. 
As my compulsion to perform like my new heroes increased, I frequently went over to their apartment and sang and danced for them. As soon as I could master any song, I knocked on their door and sang it for them while doing a little choreographed two-step, hopping from one foot to the other. When I sang, it momentarily tempered some of my doubt and pain. Everything just felt right. Chapter 2 When I was eight, just before I started third grade, my family moved from Upper Manhattan to a working-class Jewish neighborhood in a distant section of Queens. I had never seen anything like it. Trees lined the block, coming right up out of the pavement, and across the street from us was a plant nursery that took up an entire block. I kept looking for forest rangers, or lassie. Most of the adults in the area went into Manhattan for work, but the neighborhood functioned like a small town in the middle of nowhere. Within a few tree-lined blocks were a library, a post office, a butcher, a baker, a shoe store, an A.M.P. grocery, a toy store, a hardware store, a pizza parlor, and an ice cream shop. I noticed one thing missing, though. A record shop. Most of the buildings were two-story houses. Some were divided in half to form adjoining row houses. Others, like ours, were divided into four apartments, two upstairs and two downstairs, with a yard in the front. I still shared a bedroom with my sister Julia, but my parents had a room of their own now. There were lots of kids in the area. My new school was PS 164. Instead of individual chairs and desks, the classrooms had two-person desks. I prayed the teachers would put me on the right-hand side so the kid I shared a desk with would see my left ear, the good one. I didn't want anyone looking at what I considered my bad side, not to mention that I couldn't hear people if they were speaking into my deaf side all the time. At some point on the first day, a teacher named Mrs. Sundyke called me up to her desk. I walked to the front of the class. She was looking at my ear. Oh, God, please don't do this. Let me look at your ear, she said. No, no, no. She started examining me like a scientific specimen. This was my worst nightmare. I was petrified. I was shattered. What should I do? I desperately wanted to open my mouth and say, Don't do that. But I remained silent. I took a deep breath and waited for it to be over. If I ignore it, it doesn't exist. Don't show your pain. Not long after that incident, I was taking a walk with my father. Dad, am I good looking? He seemed taken aback. He stopped in his tracks and looked down at the ground. Well, he said, you're not bad looking. Thanks. Ten points for my dad. It was just the perfect sort of encouragement that an isolated, hopelessly self-conscious young boy needed. Unfortunately, it would become a familiar pattern with my parents. I started to build a wall around myself. My way of dealing with other kids became to preemptively push them away. I started to act like a smartass or a clown, putting myself in a position where nobody wanted to be around me. I wished I weren't alone all the time, but at the same time I did things to keep people away from me. The conflict inside could be excruciating. I was helpless. A lot of the other kids in the neighborhood went to Hebrew school together, which reinforced their friendships from PS-164 and created others beyond school. My family lit candles and observed Jewish holidays in some vague ways, but we weren't very observant. I was never bar mitzvahed. But the reason I didn't go to Hebrew school had nothing to do with any of that. I simply told my parents I didn't want to go. What I didn't say was why. Sure, I felt Jewish, but I didn't want to subject myself to being around any more people. Life was bleak enough without putting myself into even more situations where I would be paralyzed by the fear of humiliation. Okay, school lets out at 3 o'clock. Hey, how about more of the same at 3.30 from a different batch of kids? Great. PS-164 did have a glee club that interested me, a chance to sing. Every year they put on a musical and they auditioned anyone who wanted to try out for a part. The first year I decided to audition. When it was my turn, I stood up on the stage in front of other people, opened my mouth, and expected to sing. But all that came out was a little squeak. I ended up in the chorus, an able seaman in HMS Pinafore, or whatever. Every year after that, fourth, fifth, and sixth grades, I wanted to roll in one of those productions, but every year I choked at the audition. That same tiny voice was all that came out. 
I ended up in the chorus every time, despite the fact that when I sat through the auditions, I knew I could outsing many of the students who managed to land the leads. PS-164 was also the home to a scout troop. After I saw a few schoolmates in their blue uniforms, I thought about joining. When a new friend of mine, Harold Schiff, showed up in his uniform, I took him up on his offer to go with him to a meeting. Harold ran with the mainstream kids, but had also befriended a few loners like me. He was tight with some other guys in the troupe, like Eric London, who played in the school orchestra with Harold, and Jay Singer, who played piano. I had run across Eric and Jay in Glee Club, but their friendship with Harold was based more on attending Hebrew school together. I stuck to myself for the most part. Even when I joined something, I operated at the periphery. Everybody in the scouts was trying to get merit badges for tying knots or helping old ladies cross the street, but I didn't give a crap about that stuff. The only thing that appealed to me was going camping. And sure enough, we took some weekend camping trips. But I had a problem when I lost sight of the other people when we were out hiking. That was really the first time I realized that being deaf on one side meant I had no sense of direction. I remember standing in a clearing listening to someone yell, We're over here! I had no idea where the voice was coming from. Without the ability to triangulate the sound, it was impossible. I felt vulnerable because I didn't know where I was. Yet another way I couldn't place myself. My instinct was still to cling to my parents. But whenever I got home from a situation like that, looking for a sense of security, they let me down. Ignore it and it will go away remained the household mantra. Same old story. I would have loved more assurance and less hitting, but it just wasn't going to happen. My parents steadfastly refused to acknowledge the trouble I was having despite the fact that it was so obvious. I sleepwalked at home. Sometimes at night I would sort of come to and realize I was in the living room. Sometimes I was aware of my parents turning me around and directing me back to my bed. They knew. They just never acknowledged it or tried to figure out what was wrong. I also had two recurring nightmares. In one, it was pitch black and I was on a floating dock in a huge body of water, far from any shore. I was stranded and alone. I started yelling for help. Night after night. I'm alone on a floating dock far from shore, surrounded by darkness. I would wake up, screaming in my bed. In the other nightmare, I was sitting in the driver's seat of a car, barreling down a dark, empty highway. The car had no steering wheel. I had to try to maneuver it by leaning from side to side, but there was no way to control it. Night after night, these nightmares left me suddenly awake, screaming, confused, deathly afraid. Things with my sister were going south, too. By the time I was in junior high, Julia was getting more and more self-destructive. My parents started periodically committing her to state mental facilities. After she bounced in and out of state facilities, my parents spent what for them was a fortune on an expensive private psychiatric hospital. When she was at home, she ran away a lot, and my parents could spend days looking for her. Sometimes I woke up in the morning to see my parents had gone yet another night without sleep, and I wondered, will all this kill them? Julia would hang out in the East Village and crash at people's apartments and take drugs. Once when she was at home, she stole a drawer of silver dollars my mother had been collecting and sold them to buy drugs. I know now that what she was doing would be called self-medicating, but back then, I didn't analyze it much. When she was gone, she was gone, and when she was there, I was scared. One afternoon, after my parents brought Julia home from an institution where she had received electroshock therapy, they left us home alone. They just dropped her off and left me with a violent nutcase only a few hours removed from a mental hospital who just happened to be my sister. While they were out, Julia got angry at something and started chasing me around with a hammer. I was terrified. I ran into a bedroom and locked the door. I sat there listening at the door, swallowing hard, praying my parents would come home. Oh God, please come home. Then I heard a crashing sound as Julia started swinging the hammer wildly at the door. She kept at it. Bang! 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 The wood cracked and splintered, and the hammer began to wedge its way through the door as she continued to flail at it with all her strength. Then suddenly she stopped. The hammer was lodged in the wood, and everything went quiet. I curled up and counted the minutes, and then the hours. Will they come home before she starts up again? They did. What happened here, they asked. 
I told them that Julia had come after me with the hammer. But then they lashed out at me, as if it was my fault. They yelled at me, then they hit me. I had been so scared, and now my head reeled in confusion. You left me with her. That was your choice, not mine. She tried to kill me. School continued to be a challenge, too. When I was in grade school, I had tested my way into the gifted and talented track. At the start of junior high, I was once again placed with the gifted children. I wouldn't have made it on the basis of my grades. I was never a good student. But entrance to the gifted track was gauged purely on some sort of intelligence test. While my IQ apparently qualified me, I remained at the bottom of the class. I was the one they scratched their heads about. I guess they thought I didn't want to learn. What they failed to realize was that my ear put me at a terrible disadvantage. I simply couldn't hear a lot of what was said in class, and if I missed a sentence, I was lost. Once I got lost, I surrendered. I gave up because I'd lost the thread. At parent-teacher conferences, the teachers always told my parents the same things. He's bright, but he doesn't apply himself, or he's bright, but he doesn't work to his potential. No teacher ever told them he's bright, but he can't understand what I'm saying. Back then, kids didn't benefit from the recognition of learning disabilities. But my parents knew I was deaf in one ear. And yet, after every parent-teacher conference, they came home and admonished me. God gave you this wonderful brain, and you're not using it. I cried. I felt guilty. Tomorrow I'll turn over a new leaf, I vowed. Which was all well and good until I went back to school the next day and still couldn't hear at which point I couldn't follow what the teacher was saying, and there I was, feeling like a quitter all over again. I knew that if I didn't do something, things were going to end badly. Did that mean failure? Did that mean taking my own life? I wasn't sure. To live in misery, to live a lie, to take it out on other people, I knew this was all bad, and I knew it was untenable. I didn't know where it would end, but I knew it would end badly. It was a horrible situation, and I stewed over it at night. In addition to the nightmares and sleepwalking, I became a hypochondriac, in the extreme. I believed I was dying. I would lie awake at night, afraid to fall asleep lest I never wake up. Eventually, I would doze off, unable to keep my eyes open any longer. It was the same every night. You're dying. You're in trouble. Then, lo and behold, I got my first transistor radio. It opened an entirely different world, a separate place where I could go whenever I put the single earpiece in my functioning left ear. Music once again became my sanctuary, giving me at least a fleeting sense of safety and solitude. And in February 1964, a few weeks after my 12th birthday, I saw the Beatles on The Ed Sullivan Show. As I watched them singing, it hit me. This is my ticket out. Here was the vehicle I could use to rise out of misery, to become famous, to be looked up to, to be liked, to be admired, to be envied. And with no rational basis, I convinced myself, I can do that. I can touch that nerve. I had never played a guitar in my life, and I certainly had never written a song. And yet, this was my ticket out. I just knew it. Immediately, I started to grow my hair out, aspiring to a Beatles mop top. Partly I did it for style, but it was obvious why the style appealed to me. I could cover the stump I had instead of a right ear. Somehow, this was lost on my parents. They badgered me as my hair grew out and threatened to cut it. One afternoon, not long after I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, I bumped into a kid from my neighborhood named Matt Rail. He told me he had an electric guitar and played music. He was a grade behind me in school, but I was very impressed. All I needed now was an electric guitar, and I, too, could start playing music. And I thought I knew how to get one. For the next 11 months, as the British invasion quickly brought not only the Beatles, but the Dave Clark Five, the Kinks, the Rolling Stones, the Searchers, Manfred Mann, Jerry and the Pacemakers, the Animals, the list was endless. I pestered my parents for an electric guitar for my 13th birthday. It means the world to me, I told them. Chapter 3 On the morning of January 20th, 1965, I woke up excited. My birthday had finally arrived. Finally, an electric guitar. Look under your bed, my mom told me. I leaned over excitedly and peered under the bed. I saw a big alligator print cardboard case. 
It looked like an acoustic guitar. My heart sank. I pulled it out from under the bed and opened the case. Sure enough, it was a used Japanese acoustic guitar with nylon strings. The top had been cracked and shoddily repaired. I was crushed. I closed the case and pushed it back under the bed. I didn't want to play it. My parents came from families that emphasized the need to keep kids down rather than lift them up. That was how they thought kids should be raised. They had made a point of not giving me something I wanted before, despite the fact that it would have been just as easy for them to do. They didn't want me to get a big head, I guess. Once I had rejected the guitar, they made me feel guilty about it, never acknowledging their role in this enormous disappointment. My friend from Scouts, Harold Schiff, did get an electric guitar for his birthday a few weeks later. A powder blue Fender Mustang with a mother of pearl pickguard. He immediately started a band. And he asked me to be the singer. Harold's friends Eric London and Jay Singer, whom I knew casually from Glee Club and Scouts, soon joined. Eric played bass in the school orchestra and just plucked the same instrument as a stand-up bass. Jay, who already knew how to play piano, had recently gotten an electric keyboard, a Farfisa organ. Harold got another kid he'd gone to Hebrew school with named Arvin Miro to be the drummer. It turned out that I recognized him from Glee Club, too. Then I suggested we talk to Matt Rail, who lived next door to Eric. So Matt joined as the lead guitar player. Matt and I were the only ones in the group whose parents weren't doctors of one kind or another. Harold and Matt lived in houses as opposed to apartments. Their places had basements. Matt's older brother, John, already had a band, too, and his parents were pretty tolerant about noise. Harold's mom didn't mind the noise either, and we'd have the shift's basement to ourselves, so that was where we set up first. Harold's basement was finished. The walls were lined with knotty pine wood paneling. There was a linoleum floor and even a window. There was a door to the backyard, too, which was below street level. Harold and Matt would plug both of their guitars into one amp, and my vocals went through the amp used by Jay Singer's keyboard. I often banged a tambourine as I sang. That was something you saw singers on TV do a lot. Eric just had to pluck the bass as loud as he could. We ran through Satisfaction by the Stones and other songs by British invasion bands like the Kinks and the Yardbirds. And to take advantage of Jay's Farfisa sound, we learned Liar Liar by the Castaways. I loved it from the start. And even though all the kids had vague dreams of being rock musicians at that time, given the frenzy over the Beatles and the Stones, their parents had their lives planned out for them. These kids were going to become dentists and optometrists like their parents, and for them, the band was a lark. But I kept telling them, I am going to be a rock star. Matt Rail and I started hanging out a lot at his house. In addition to practicing together, sometimes we got to sit around during rehearsals of his brother John's band. Matt and I played music so much at his house that his mother eventually proposed a deal. If we refinished an old bookshelf she had bought upstate, we could officially call the basement our practice space. So we stripped the white paint off that old bookshelf and kept playing. Matt's parents were sort of proto-hippies. His mom had actually sung on the first Weaver's recordings and was friends with Pete Seeger. She had babysat for Woody Guthrie's children. By the time I got to know his parents, his mom was still booking prominent folk and blues musicians for hoot nannies in Manhattan. People like Sonny Terry, Brownie McGee, and Lead Belly, as well as Seeger. I listened obsessively to the radio and knew the pop hits of the day, but at Matt's place, I was exposed to his parents' amazing collection of folk music. They had tons of country blues and old-time music and lots of contemporary folk by the likes of Bob Dylan, Eric Anderson, Tom Rush, Phil Oakes, Buffy St. Marie and Judy Collins. Eventually, I pulled my acoustic guitar out from under the bed, and Matt showed me some chords. Then I took a couple of lessons from a woman who had placed an ad in the local paper. The first song I learned to play was Down in the Valley. Soon, I had a harmonica around my neck and was trying to mimic the folk music I now knew from Matt's house. The band continued to practice, too, and that summer of 1965, we got our first gig. There was a mayoral election that year, and John Lindsay's campaign had a local office in our neighborhood. It was housed in a storefront, just an open room with bright lights. Harold was volunteering for the campaign, distributing pamphlets. I think he thought it was something mature and cool to do. And one day the guy in charge of the office was talking about some kind of party or rally and mentioned they needed entertainment. 
Even though he hadn't been talking to Harold, Harold piped up, Um, I have a band. They invited us to play at the event. I guess it looked good for the Democratic Party to have neighborhood kids playing. We didn't get paid, and not many people were there, but still, it was a gig. My first gig. Sometimes when the band practiced, I got Harold to show me bar chords on his Fender Mustang. The basics came pretty easily, but if I had realized then how long it would take me to become a somewhat proficient guitar player, I probably would have given up on the spot. At the time, though, it just drove me on. Messing around in the basement was fine, but I wanted to get an electric guitar of my own and get serious. I started taking the subway into Manhattan whenever I could to scour the music stores on 48th Street for affordable guitars. Those trips into town became pilgrimages for me. Between 6th and 7th Avenues, independent music stores lined both sides of 48th Street, and a block up on 49th Street and 7th Avenue was a sandwich shop called Blimpy's. I get a sub sandwich there or a Texas chili dog covered in gooey yellow cheese and chili and onions at Orange Julius, and then I'd wander the music stores. Back then, you weren't allowed to touch anything. If you wanted to play an instrument, they'd ask, Are you buying today? And if someone didn't look the part, like me, they'd say, let me see that you really have the money on you. So those trips to 48th Street were not about playing, but about soaking in the trappings of rock and roll. Drum kits, guitars, basses. And once in a while, I spotted a musician I recognized from TV or from the music magazines I was starting to collect. I was in heaven. As junior high progressed, I started skipping school more and more to hop the bus to the subway and head for 48th Street. I would arrive early in the morning, before the shops were open, so this Jewish kid would go sit in a pew in St. Patrick's Cathedral on 49th Street and 5th Avenue and wait. I also found a record store a block from the cathedral called The Record Hunter, where they let you listen to records. They had banks of turntables with headphones, and you could have them open anything up and play it. That became my idea of a perfect day, waiting in the cathedral for the record store to open, listening to music, having a chili dog, and looking at guitars. Exploring closer to home, I found that if I took the southbound Q44 bus from my apartment to the last stop in Jamaica, Queens, there was a huge two-story record store called Triborough Records. They had thousands of albums, and since it was a predominantly black neighborhood, I was able to pick up things I had not been exposed to before. James Brown, Joe Tex, and Otis Redding, as well as black comedians like Red Fox, Pigmeat Markham, and Moms Mabley. I didn't always have money to buy something, but just being able to hold the records and look at the covers was enough to make it worthwhile. After I saved money for a year and added the money I got for my 14th birthday, I went to 48th Street one day and walked into a music store called Manny's. Eyeing a guitar, I said, Can I see that one, please? You buying today, came the response. Yes. Show me the money. I plunked down all the money I had, and the man behind the counter handed me the guitar I was going to buy. A three-quarter size, two-pickup Stratocaster knockoff built by Vox. It wasn't much of a guitar, but it was the one I could afford. It was cheaper than anything else because it wasn't full size, and besides, I knew nothing about guitars and could barely play. But now, I really had my ticket out. Chapter 4 I began to try to write songs as soon as I had the electric guitar. Somehow it just seemed like the natural thing to do. Playing the instrument and writing songs went hand in hand. Whenever I heard songs I liked, I tried to emulate them. One of my first attempts was an homage to the Who's The Kids Are All Right. I also studied the song structures of brill-building writers like Barry Mann and Cynthia Weil, Jerry Goffin and Carole King, Jeff Barry and Ellie Greenwich, songs with a verse, chorus, and bridge with great hooks, songs so catchy you knew them already by the time the second chorus arrived. They were about melodies and telling a story. Harold Schiff's basement band had stalled, but Matt Rail and I jammed together constantly once I got my guitar. Sometimes a kid named Neil Tiemann would join us on drums. We called ourselves Uncle Joe and continued to add songs to our repertoire. Matt was having problems of his own, however, and at some point his parents enrolled him in a private school in Manhattan. My hair was really long now, but it was curly. At the time, I hated the curls because the style was straight hair. So I'd buy a relaxer cream called Permastrate. 
It was available in nearby black neighborhoods. Permastrate smelled like ammonia and heavy chemicals, and it burned your scalp like nobody's business. You had to apply it to your hair, comb it back, let it sit, and then comb it forward. On occasions, when I left it in too long, my scalp would bleed. Sometimes I'd iron my hair, too, anything to straighten it out. The mother of another kid I became friends with, David Unn, called me Prince Valiant because of the look. My dad, meanwhile, had taken to calling me Stanley Fatass. I'd met David Unn at Parsons Junior High, and his family, like Matt's, were nurturing and artistic. His dad was a painter, his mom a teacher. Like me, David had really long hair. Sometimes when I skipped school to go into Manhattan and haunt 48th Street, he went with me. He was big into music, too. David and I also started mixing as best we could with the budding counterculture. One day, walking down Main Street in my neighborhood, I noticed a new shop called Middle Earth. It was a head shop selling water pipes and glass bongs and all sorts of drug paraphernalia. The people behind the counter inside had long hair, too. Maybe I would fit in here. I didn't fit in with normal people, that was for sure, but here, right in my own neighborhood, was an alternative. I started to hang out there and talk with the owners as well as a few of the customers who came and went. It wasn't about the drugs, though I did start to smoke pot once in a while. It was about seeking acceptance. To an outcast or someone in a sort of self-imposed exile, Middle Earth felt comfortable. Eventually, I started taking my acoustic guitar to the shop and playing it while hanging out. One girl in my school, Ellen Menton, treated me with an extraordinary amount of patience and understanding. I trusted her enough to try to explain some of my inner demons, but hinting at my problems didn't reduce my anxiety. Ellen wanted us to become a normal junior high couple, go to the movies together or whatever, but I was incapable of doing things with her in public. It felt too risky, too suffocating, too claustrophobic. What if someone started making fun of me while we were together? I also couldn't understand why she wanted to be with someone like me. With or without the long hair, I was a freak after all. I even asked her, why do you like me? Why do you want to be around me? It made no sense to me at all. Ellen and I stayed friends, but being with someone who was steadfastly caring was all but unbearable. Even riding the bus together to go see a movie involved risks I couldn't get myself to take. My dad decided to give me his version of the birds and the bees around that time. Out of the blue on one of our walks, he said, if you get someone pregnant, you're on your own. Did that mean I'd be out on the street at age 14? Great. I barely knew how to get someone pregnant, but now I knew it was a one-way ticket to getting thrown out. As if I'm not already on my own. I spent the bulk of my time on my own, at home, in my room, shutting everything out and immersing myself in music. Listening to my transistor radio, playing guitar, reading music magazines. My mom, feeling guilty about the way my sister's plight was consuming all her time, also bought me a stereo. I became an avid follower of Scott Muni's radio program, The English Power Hour, one of the early FM radio shows to highlight the latest sounds from the UK. In the spring of 1967, Jimi Hendrix, who had moved to the UK, was dominating the English scene and charts, and his music started to filter back to the States on shows like Muni's. When his first album finally arrived, it hit me like an atom bomb. I loved to put the Jimi Hendrix Experience album on my new stereo and lie down and press the big speakers against both sides of my head. Even though I was deaf on the right side, when I pressed the speaker against my head, I could hear through bone conduction. I also painted my room purple and strung a set of flashing Christmas lights along the ceiling. I played my guitar and looked at myself in the mirror, lights flashing, and tried to perfect jumps and windmills like Pete Townsend of The Who. But perhaps the greatest effect Hendrix had was on hairstyles. His hair was teased up in a huge puff, and soon Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page had done the same to their hair. Suddenly, that became the look. I remember the first day I blew out my hair. No more permastraight for me. As I emerged from my room and got ready to leave the house with my hair now exploding around my head like my hero's hair, my mom said, You're not going out like that, are you? Yep, see you later. It was time to let my freak flag fly. As junior high neared the end, I auditioned for the High School of Music and Art, a public alternative school on West 135th Street and Convent Avenue in Manhattan. 
I had been one of the best visual artists in my junior high. Drawing was my thing. But equally important, I hoped this specialized school would be a more comfortable environment than the meat grinders I had attended up to that point. I had gone from being stared at for something beyond my control, my ear, to being stared at for something of my own making, my outlandish hair and clothes. Most schools still had dress codes in those days, but the philosophy at music and art was that it didn't matter what you came to school wearing as long as you came to school. As I saw it, instead of being the freak in school, I'd go to a school of freaks. Chapter 5 Even though drawing was my ticket into music and art, I wasn't thinking very seriously about trying to make a career of art which turned out to be a good thing because it was sobering to show up at school in the fall of 1967 and see not only so many people who were as good as I was, but also plenty who were clearly better. I had pursued art primarily because there was no school for aspiring rock stars. Art was a backup plan. No longer. I knew now it was music or bust. Even so, when I headed off to school each day, my musical aspirations stayed behind, carefully stashed in my purple bedroom. Though I never told fellow students at school about my aspirations or tried to switch to the music curriculum, I was aware that music and art students had an impressive track record of making a musical impact. And not just on Broadway and in orchestras. A band called The Left Bank, who had had a big hit with Walk Away Renee, were recent grads as was the brilliant singer-songwriter Laura Nero. Janice Ian, who had just had a hit with Society's Child, was still enrolled when I arrived. One day, Matt Rail's older brother, John, came around to see me. He'd already had several bands, and we all looked up to him. His first band was influenced by the Ventures, surf music, but these days he was leading one called the Post-War Baby Boom that sounded like some of the stuff coming out of San Francisco. A hippie take on folk, blues, and jug band sounds. They had a girl singer who took leads on some songs. That stuff was a bit like Grace Slick's first band, The Great Society, and the post-war baby boom actually played gigs. Out of nowhere, John asked me to join the band. They needed a rhythm guitar player. My mind raced. Why hadn't they asked Matt, who at that point was a better guitar player than I was? Maybe because I'm in high school and Matt has another year of junior high? Is Matt going to be pissed? Holy shit, a real band. This is huge. I didn't hesitate for another second. I said yes. Next thing I knew, we were rehearsing in the same basement where Matt and I had previously practiced. We worked on an up-tempo cover of Gershwin's Summertime. I also worked out a version of Born in Chicago by the Paul Butterfield Blues Band and even sang lead vocals. Everybody else in the band was at least two years older than me, which at that age seemed like a lot. What didn't occur to me at that time was that they would graduate high school at the end of that school year. But in the short term, I was all in. We had a few gigs in our new lineup, and then I suggested we try to get a recording contract. I said we should have some pictures taken, and I knew just who to call. That summer of 1967, I'd spent two ill-fated weeks at a summer camp near the Catskills Mountains. Or at least it was supposed to be a summer camp. It turned out to be a scam. Some guy got a bunch of parents to pay him to have their kids come up to his farm, camp out, and it turned out help him tear down an old barn. He called it a work camp, implying that his program represented a chance for city kids to work on the land. In the end, though, it had been kind of fun, and I'd become friends with one of the counselors who were as duped as the campers. His name was Maury Englander, and he was now working for a famous photographer in Manhattan. Maury had access to the photographer's studio whenever it wasn't being used. That was one of the perks of the job, since Maury was in the process of becoming a photographer himself and, in fact, would be working for magazines like Newsweek less than a year later. So I called him, and we arranged to go into the studio one weekend and have Maury take some promo shots. Maury was pretty wired in politically as well, and we parlayed the photo session into a few gigs playing parties for various anti-war organizations in early 1968 as protests against the Vietnam War were picking up steam. Club gigs were tough to come by because they still wanted top 40 cover bands for the most part. We played a lot of our own songs, and the covers we did were not the sorts of songs at the top of the charts. I arranged an audition for us at a place called The Night Owl, 
I had read that the Love and Spoonful had played there, and the Spoonful's jug band roots and good time sound weren't so far off from what the post-war baby boom was trying to do. But at the audition, the guy who was making the decision walked out while we were still playing. We didn't get that gig. Despite the slow going, I wanted to succeed and worked at it ceaselessly. Eventually, I managed to pass some material to somebody with an in at CBS Records, and an exec from the label called me. If you guys can play as good as you look, you'll be great, he said. He was referring to one of the studio shots Maury Englander had taken of the band. Before the guy ever saw us in person or heard us, he arranged for us to record a demo at CBS. I wrote a song for us to record called Never Loving, Never Living, but I was too shy to play it for the band until the day before we were supposed to cut it. And then our female vocalist decided to go for a swim in the fountain in Washington Square Park in Greenwich Village the night before, and she caught a cold and lost her voice. When we showed up in the studio the next day, my first time ever in a real recording studio, she couldn't sing. To top it all off, the CBS exec told us he wanted to rename the band The Living Abortions. The demo never got finished. Meanwhile, at Music and Art, despite keeping to myself the chance to see girls in t-shirts and no bras, another advantage of the lack of a dress code was more than enough to get me to school every day. But I soon found I was at odds with myself and everybody else. I looked hipper than I really was because of my hair and clothes. But my hair was blown out in part for one very specific reason, and I felt intimidated by the kids I thought were genuinely hip. As I slowly learned, covering my ear didn't change anything. Like everything else in life, ultimately it wasn't about what other people saw, it was about what I knew and what I felt. One day at school, one of the cool girls called out to me. Victoria was curvy and blonde with disarming blue eyes. It was well known that she had the coolest friends in and out of school. I was wearing a leather jacket with a fringe, which was a hip look at the time, and a look not many people were rocking yet, even at music and art. A fringe, she said. I went over to talk to her and somehow mustered the courage to ask her out. It was like an out-of-body experience. Somebody was talking, and it was me, but I felt totally disconnected because it was such a leap into uncharted territory. She said yes, and I walked away in a state of exhilaration and terror. We went to a concert at the Fillmore East, but when we got there, she knew tons of other people in the audience. We wound up sitting with her friends. I was immediately intimidated because they were hip, and I was an uptight kid from Queens. They started passing a joint. I took a hit each time it was passed to me, and I got pretty high. Soon I was talking nonstop until Victoria said, What the hell are you talking about? That shut me up for the rest of the show. After the concert, we went back to her parents' apartment. I was still really stoned and also paranoid because Victoria had seen a chink in my armor and questioned my coolness. I ended up talking to her dad and continuing to talk to him long after she had slipped off to her room and gone to bed. I eventually slithered out of the apartment feeling like a complete jerk. From then on in school, she snickered whenever we ran into each other. I don't think she meant to be mean, but she wasn't laughing with me. Another girl I saw briefly lived in Staten Island. She was half Italian and half Norwegian and lived in an Italian neighborhood. She was hooked on speed. Between me being a bit stocky and her having no appetite, I often got to eat her lunch, which her mom lovingly prepared, not knowing who would actually end up savoring it. The first time I met her mom, she seemed to like me. The next time I went over to her house to pick her up, I wasn't allowed in the house. I can't go inside, I said to the girl. No, my mom thought you were Italian, but then she found out you're a Jew. That was my introduction to the wonderful world of anti-Semitism. After a while, the double whammy of my insecurity and my inability to hear what was going on in class had me falling into the same old pattern in school of getting lost, getting frustrated, isolating myself, and eventually cutting school as often as I could get away with it. I knew how many days I could be absent, how many classes I could miss, how many times I could be late, and I used them all to their fullest. Those were the school statistics that mattered most to me. I became a ghost, hardly ever in school, and when I was there, nearly invisible. I sat in the back of my classes and barely spoke to anybody. 
Once again, I was living in self-imposed exile as a result of my defensiveness and social anxiety. Once again, I was beginning to shut down. Life was poisonous and desolate. My sleeping problems returned. Once again, I would wake up screaming from the familiar nightmares, sure that I was dying. I'm alone on a floating dock, far from shore, surrounded by darkness.